Uh, so yeah. Thanks for your attendance, for your interest and in joining me today. Um, my name is Max Meer. I'm the uh, Free Software Foundation Europe's Germany coordinator. And today I will be talking about the Radio Lockdown Directive and why this, so what this is and why this will be a major threat for free software on our radio devices. So um, I will start my presentation today um, with explaining what this radio lockdown is, what this directive is exactly, um, why it is dangerous for us, for free software people or for all, basically all people who are using radio devices, how we can fight it in the future, what we are already doing, what we plan to do, and in the very few minutes or in the last minutes I will try to discuss the whole topic and also answer your questions if you have any. So what is Radio Lockdown? Radio Lockdown, we call, is, like the official name is the Radio Equipment Directive with this very sexy name 2014-53-U. And the Radio Lockdown itself is just a small article. So I don't want to annoy you with um, legal, too many uh, small legal things, but it's this article 33i. And um, it's a directive from, by the EU Parliament. So passed the EU Parliament already in the mid of 2014, um, but it will come in effect in June 2017, so this year. So this Article 33i, what's in there? In this directive, there is this article stating, radio equipment shall be so constructed that it complies with the following essential requirements. Then there's a list of some things that make sense and some of that are not that much important to us. But the last point is, so these, um, these equipments should support certain features in order to ensure that software can only be loaded into the radio equipment where the compliance of the combination of radio equipment and the software has been demonstrated. So this sounds pretty boring, right? Um, why is it so important? Well, first of all, what is this compliance? Compliance means that the equipment or the software on it complies with the, with the signal frequencies, uh, the signal strength, and uh, that it contains some certain features um, that are required by law, like by the radio uh, regulating authorities in the member states. So how should this happen? So you still don't seem to be so convinced that it's really bad, but how should, how should manufacturers make sure that software can only be loaded onto the devices that met these requirements. Well, in fact, it's a signature-based verification. And uh, we already know this um, in, in other fields with trust chains. Um, some manufacturers call it high assurance boot. We know this from the com uh, personal computer uh, or the computer sector with secure boot, what we've seen with uh, Microsoft happening. And in fact, it's just another digital restriction management, a DRM. So that we as users cannot, can no longer access the devices or cannot no lo longer um, do everything with the devices that we could do, but that there is a software restriction on it. So um, the regulating authorities or the ones that uh, stand behind that call that also cognitive radio. And what is that? That's more or less like a real-time communication of each and every radio device, so each device that can send or receive radio, um, communicating with the regulatory authorities. So again, this could be a solution, how this can be realized. It's not, in fact, already installed, but this could, can be how it can look like. So that every device already always knows where it is located, in which member state, in which country, and that it can obtain um, a spectrum license from this regulatory authority so that the device always knows or the software on it always knows how and what frequencies can I send um, with which signal strength so for example in Germany uh, routers may only send with um, 100 milliwatts in the Wi-Fi um, frequency band so that the device always knows where it is and what is it is allowed to do so uh, one of the people who is um, working on that topic too calls it the, the wet dream of uh, the regulators. So yeah, why is this dangerous? 
Well, first of all, it affects all radio-capable devices. So all devices that can send or receive radio waves. So, for example, th these are the routers that we were talking about. But this is also a smartphone. Or, excuse me, yeah? Receivers, where the regulatory exactly. doesn't make sense at all. Just repeating that for the for the stream, that it's also not only sending devices, but also pure devices that re oh, devices that only receive signals, like for for example uh, GPS receivers. Uh, <laughs> yes. So this is really crazy. Um, this is basically bad for many things, for example, for free software initiatives like OpenWRT or the communities around the Android custom ROMs, uh, community Wi-Fi projects like uh, Freifunk, but also for the people who are writing the drivers for Wi-Fi devices or uh, something like that. So basically, all people that write software that can be loaded onto hardware devices, which are or which they buy from, from the shelf somewhere. So this is bad because we still don't know, or we have no idea, and in this directive it's not written, how this compliance assessment process should be running. So the manufacturers have to check or have to, to make sure that only software can be loaded onto these, those devices that meet these requirements. Um, but how does, does this procedure look like? Um, as far as we know, if you write a firmware or software that should be loaded onto a device, you have to send this software to the manufacturer and then somehow, magically, he finds out whether this is okay or this is not okay. But there's no definition on how long um, this process should take place, if they only have four weeks or four years. Yeah. This has to happen probably for every single software that is written, so for every update as well. So if you're a developer of, of OpenWRT, for every security update, you may have to send your software to the manufacturer, and he then has to assess whether the software meets the requirements. So this is raising the costs extremely, the time-wise costs, and uh, maybe also the hardware costs for community Wi-Fi projects. Maybe they have to choose other models, other router models, for example, that are more costly because the manufacturers have a better process of assessing the software. And yeah, this is just crazy bureaucracy, right? Because for everything we have to send the software somewhere and have to check it somehow and we have this trust chains and so on. This is really bad for free software businesses. It's a completely legit business model to buy off-the-shelf hardware and build a software or firmware around it and then sell it to your customers. And this directive, um, yeah, installs a, a huge competition issue um, because the manufacturer of the original hardware can just take or take himself a long time to assess the software of the software or the, the free software business or whatever business. So um, they can influence how fast software updates can be rolled out and features can be rolled out. This is really bad for device security because it disables us, the users and the people outside, to update their firmware or to, to install new software, new firmware on the devices that we own, actually. Um, many people want to install more secure or more privacy-friendly software on their devices. For example, if you buy a smartphone nowadays, um, it's full of proprietary software. And maybe you want to install an, a custom ROM which contains at least less proprietary software uh, or more free software on it. So these people will be hindered to, to secure themselves. And then this whole signature checking process um, involves that on the devices they are, will most likely be running a virtual machine. So we have another attack vector on our devices. So it's another small computer inside these computers um, that can be attacked, and most, so probably, this will be a black box, so proprietary software. So we lose, again, control over our devices. This is really bad for sustainability and the environment, because, um, for example, I take the, the routers again, 
um, routers after two or three years, they don't get any updates anymore. And people are used to then maybe installing other firmware on it, like the, the mentioned LEED or OpenWRT, to in length the, the life cycle of their hardware. If the manufacturer then doesn't assess the software anymore for older devices and doesn't um, allow the software to be loaded, uh, yeah, the devices that we bought are in a few years very insecure and we have to throw them away because we cannot use them anymore productively. And in fact, it's rather senseless, all this stuff. As was mentioned here in the, in the audience, um, it's also affecting receiving devices that do not send anything and that do not interfere with other software, uh, with other hardware, sorry. And evil people who want to do evil stuff and, and tune their devices to send on a, other frequencies or with bigger signal strength will find ways how to circumvent that. So this is targeting normal users, people who don't want to do something illegal with it. And in the past we've seen only very few incidents where hardware um, has been sending on frequencies or with signal strength that are not allowed. So, and these incidents were not uh, free software um, firmwares or devices that have been loaded with free software or other alternative firmwares, but these have in most cases been cheap China devices or something like that. So many people ask, where does this senseless directive Yes. It's the cost of research for universities and whatever increases tremendously because now they have to find special devices that are not locked down. Yes, very good. Thank you for, for the addition. Yes, I repeat that. Um, he mentioned that it also raises the cost for uh, researching projects for universities because they now have to buy other devices that maybe uh, have disabled these uh, signature-based features. So yeah, this is another problem. And there are many more, so this list is, is not uh, finished yet. So you will find many, many sectors where people are harmed. <coughs> but again, I'm coming to this point. Where does this directive actually come from? Um, as far as we know, we still don't have all the information. It's coming from the ETSI, which is the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. And as far as we know, they are concerned about software-defined radio, SDR. So SDRs, I'm no technician, so sorry if I talk a little bit crap, but <laughs> in fact, these are cheap chips or cheaper chips, and they are not limited to certain frequencies or certain signal strengths anymore, because the older chip design was that it had uh, a fixed soldered frequency and maybe also a limitation on, on strength. And now with these SDRs, for example, they could be able to send um, Wi-Fi signals and, sorry, Wi-Fi signals and um, Bluetooth signals at the same time with the same chip that um, decreases costs and, yeah, it's more or less uh, the future. But, uh, yeah, of course, you will also be able to do a lot of so to, um, with the software, when I can control the software, that I can also send on frequencies that are maybe not allowed to send on. So this is the downside, of course. So um, the Etsy or the people who stand behind this directive may also have been targeting uh, the 5G mobile networks or the, the, this technology that may come up in the future. Um, Still, again, I'm, I'm no technician, but I think it's because uh, there are also inter-device uh, communications, and so they want to regulate that a little bit. And um, some people said that it's because of the weather radars, because in the 5 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi band, there were interferences with weather radars. So these routers have to uh, have inbuilt um, a special mechanism that is communicating with these weather radar stations um, so that they are not interfering with each other on certain frequencies. And some of these devices which are not compliant um, yeah, don't support this certain feature, this uh, intercommunication feature, and therefore interfere with weather radars. But again, the number of cases where this has taken place is very little. And people also ask, is this somehow combined with, the, with this FCC router lockdown in the US? Yes, it is. As far as we know, 
um, this FCC router lockdown is a reaction on what Etsy or the European institution planned for the European markets. So they said, hey guys, in the US we want to, to um, regulate this sector. You also have to do something similar in the US so we can uh, cover the two large markets. Um, but in fact, what we have in Europe is much worse than what we have in the US. Because in the US it's only limited to Wi-Fi frequencies. And in Europe, it's really, as I said, all devices, all frequencies, sending and receiving uh, devices. So what can we do to get rid of this radio lockdown? Legally, we cannot do much anymore because this directive has, uh, been, has passed the European Parliament. Um, there is little chance that we can, uh, that we can uh, attack it uh, in front of uh, the courts. So. Um, we have to somehow find other ways. One problem we still have is that we have still have too little background information. So we still don't really know what is the position of certain industries, or do they already know about um, this radio lockdown? Um, what do the European institutions or the member states institu institutions think about that? For example, yeah, we have in, in all those member states, we have network agencies or something similar. What do they, what do they think about that? And uh, what are politicians thinking about that? What is their position? Or do they already know what will come up in the future? I really doubt it. So, yeah. But initially, so uh, around about one year ago, we started, the FSFE started uh, setting up a joint statement against radio lockdown. And up to this day, there were 46 organizations and companies signing this joint statement where we summarize what radio lockdown is, why it is bad, and stating some demands to the EU institutions. And yes, we are tr still trying to increase this list, and this is only a small selection of the organizations and companies that are supporting us. <coughs> but now coming to the, how we can really fight it in the future, this was only uh, raising awareness. In the directive, there is a passage that the European Commission is allowed to make delegated acts. And delegated acts are a possibility to, um, in this case, to define the classes of devices which are affected by radio lockdown. This sounds a little bit complicated, but the European Commission can define, um, for example, we, that all devices that send, send Wi-Fi signals are excluded from the radio lockdown. Um, in order to influence this, we applied for an expert group of the EU Commission um, just uh, mid of January. Um, and we hope to get into there to influence this definition of classes. But we still don't know what, as I said, we still don't know what the EU institutions and the policymakers are, are targeting at. If they want to make broad exceptions for the wise classes, or if they want just yeah, want it to stay the same. And we also want to get in there to gather some information. So as far as I know, um, the Free Software Foundation Europe applied for that, and also two other organizations that we know that share parts or large parts of our, um, of our opinion on that. So yeah, let's hope that we can get into this uh, body. And in fact, we are still, oh, from the first day on, we are trying to build alliances with other sectors. So, for example, with the science sector, we, we um, started to, to uh, write and communicate what they're thinking about that and what their position is. And yes, the position of them is really um, opposing radio lockdown. We are trying to uh, raise awareness in other industries. So we have little information how it is in the router um, segment, but we still don't know what, for example, with the GPS uh, industry, what's happening there. We are trying to find alliances uh, or allies in the civil society with the amateur radio uh, operators or with community Wi-Fi projects like Freifunk or Ninux in Italy and so on. So yes, that's something that we still do and that's something that I have been doing today, raising awareness in front of you telling you that this is a really major threat for free software and for our f freedom of uh, yeah, access. And if you're 
If you're an organization or a company, please sign our joint statement. It's uh, linked down here from this page. Uh, join our mailing list. We have a moderated mailing list, or yeah, you can you can join this and uh, to discuss the issues and help us finding answers uh, for the questions we have. And yes, please discuss about that. Talk with that about uh, uh, about that with your colleagues and so on. And yes. Um, Please find me if, if you have any questions, and we cannot answer all questions. Find me at the FSFE booth in Building K in the ground floor. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Max. Question? We have skin in this game. Um, little IoT devices, too small to run digital signatures, for example. Um, so have you spoken to any people who consider themselves into the IoT game and asked them if they're happy to quadruple the price of their product to put a smarter chip in to even be able to do any of that stuff? Um, no, we have not directly spoken to anyone in this sector, but... Because um, it sounds like it kills the whole lot stone dead. Yeah, um, but I think they will be obliged to, to comply with this directive, so they have to somehow implement a virtual machine or a chip that is checking these signatures. Let me tell you, it's not happening with the sort of stuff we're doing. So it would eliminate our product category, essentially. <laughs> yeah, in the best, worst case, yeah. Sure, it would be 10x, even maybe more. Hi, very interesting talk. Uh, it wasn't clear from the text of the directive, are existing hardware devices affected as well, or just new uh, devices that are coming on the market? Just new devices, starting with those who come into the market from June 2017. So existing ones, are existing ones are excluded, as well as, and that maybe I can mention that, as well as amateur um, hardware, like hardware that is only available for amateur radio operators. But most amateur radio operators use off-the-shelf hardware that can they can buy in the in the store, so it's rather senseless. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk, Max. My name is Sebastian. I work for Julia Reda, who is the um, standing rapporteur in the European Parliament on the directive. And um, thank you for uh, you up there who raised the question regarding the 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 embedded devices that won't be able to check these signatures. So um, if I may, I would like to clarify that the signature checks are only a theoretical idea. So for now, we don't know how um, uh, manufacturers will try to implement the whole measure at all. Um, and I think, um, so what, what, is, what is happening right now is that an expert group uh, firstly needs to define the classes of devices that are at all affected by the directive. Uh, for now there is no class definition uh, ready yet and uh, as far as I know, um, if it's not ready by June 2017 then I don't know what, what happens with, with, uh, with the deadline regarding the manufacturers because they are told that they cannot uh, any longer provide these devices on the European market anymore if the class definitions aren't done until then. Um, so I would I would expect that for these I will call them dumb uh, devices uh, that won't be able to check signatures that won't be able to receive updates because uh, once in a while uh, something will be will be broken and then uh, certain devices will need to be I know you, you know all that from from Blu-ray uh, so I'll, I won't go into it. Um, so I, I would expect that these devices would be taken out of the uh, definition. Now, my question, I do have a question, um, <laughs> it, but it may not be to you, but rather to the audience, is um, so we have a couple of people uh, who we know who have applied for uh, this expert group, and uh, my question to the audience is, do you know how we can define a number of devices that should be excluded from the directive without telling the commission, well, basically exclude all SDR devices, because that won't happen. Hold on a second. Would, would you speak into the microphone? Thanks. Can I shout loud enough to get straight on the tape? <laughs> um, you could probably start with, I mean, there's, okay, I've only read the UK version of the thing which defines all the EU bans and how you're allowed to use them and the duty cycles and so on. But you could probably sensibly say that anything which is allowed to use a shared channel and that has limits on its duty cycle and its power, providing it is compliant with those, should be excluded. And that would probably exclude 90% of the non-threatening things straight away because you've already got wording which you could probably latch onto to make that happen with a stroke of a pen. Okay. 
Okay, uh, one more follow-up, Jerv, and then we have one last question. Um, it seems to me that the big problems are with batons and radiated power. And what we want to be able to do is just put our software on the device. Uh, so if, it, if the class definition excluded devices where the bands and radiated power were regulated in hardware, manufacturers could then put a little circuit on the device that prevented it going outside those bands and radiated power, but then the entire software of the device could still be open because the software wouldn't be able to break the limits imposed by the hardware. That might be a way of getting completely free software on the devices while still making sure that they couldn't go outside their limits. And the, direct, and the, the, the definition could say, if the limits are in hardware, none of this applies. Right, I'm sorry, we only have time for one last question. You had your hand up earlier. Maybe one comment to that. Um, one problem we have with the, with the um, member states, oh, so we have one problem with the member states, that um, in the 28 member states, there are different limitations on frequencies and signal strength, as far as I know. So manufacturers would have to set the limits um, for each and every country individually. But there are some that are harmonized, so those could be covered where it is harmonized. Sorry. So, sorry, there, there's, there was some... Uh, but we can we can discuss later, maybe. It would okay. be really fun. Thanks. Reading literally in the directive, uh, all the devices having fast uh, uh, converters, uh, analog to digital, would be banned. Uh, you can uh, uh, have a, a radio transmitter using a Raspberry Pi with PWM. So you should ban everything. You can, uh, Red Pitaya is a board uh, which is uh, a osc oscilloscope, but uh, you can use the FPGA to create uh, a, a radio transmitter. So how can you check all these kind of devices? Yeah, that's true. Thank you very much, Max. Unfortunately, we have to uh, clear out of the yeah. dev room now. Thanks again. Thank you.